All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Bernard. I'm an urban planner with the National Capital Planning Commission, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar call. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today to discuss the release of new digital inundation maps. Uh, we're really excited to officially release them. We think they'll be a great tool for government leaders, emergency managers, and the public uh, to view potential flood impacts during high water events along the Potomac and Anacostia rivers. Next slide. So here's a quick overview of our agenda for today. Um, in a few moments, Stacey Underwood will provide a brief overview of the background behind this mapping project. Uh, Stacey is with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Baltimore District and is also a co-leader of the District of Columbia Silver Jackets. Uh, Stacey's presentation will be followed by a live demonstration on how to use the tool by Jason Elliott. Jason is a senior service hydrologist with the National Weather Service. So as you can see on the agenda, we plan to take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, we've left about a half an hour for question and answer, so there should be enough time to get to everyone. Next slide. So if you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box in the webinar software. Uh, the chat box is on the right side, and at the bottom right, as shown on the slide uh, in front of you now, there's a drop-down box that will ask you who do you want to send it to. Please select all moderators. Um, it should be at the top of the list. So when the question and answer session comes, we'll start with the questions that we've received in the chat, and then we will also take questions over the phone once the presentations are done. Okay, so before we get into it, um, just two quick housekeeping items. First, um, I'll note that this webinar will be recorded and then later posted online. And second, um, the audience will be muted until we get to the question and answer session. So with all that, um, I will turn the call over to Stacy Underwood. Stacy, go ahead. All right, thank you, Nick. Again, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. As Nick said, I'm Stacy Underwood with the Corps of Engineers. I'm the Silver Jackets Program Coordinator and the Project Manager for this project. Uh, some of you may be wondering, what in the world is the Silver Jackets team? Well, the Silver Jackets is a program that the Corps of Engineers developed a number of years ago to bring together federal, regional, state, and local agencies to reduce flood risk in each state. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I don't know if there's two. Okay, there we go. Thank you. The uh, District of Columbia is, uh, was the 43rd team to be established a few years ago. Uh, there's now 46 state teams plus the District of Columbia. Uh, both Maryland and Virginia also have Silver Jackets teams. And one of the goals of the teams is to uh, work together, leverage resources, and implement flood risk management projects. Next slide. The DC Silver Jackets agencies that were involved in the mapping project include all of the federal agencies that you see listed there at the top, Along with the District of Columbia, there were a number of agencies involved from D.C. They were led by the Department of Energy and Environment, and then some of the uh, Virginia and Maryland uh, neighboring counties and cities. Next slide, please. So as you may be aware, D.C. is susceptible to three types of flooding. There's riverine flooding, which is floodwaters that are coming down downstream along the Potomac River and Anacostia River, such as the flood of record in 1942. It's also susceptible to tidal flooding, where water is pushed up from the Chesapeake Bay into the Potomac and Anacostia Rivers during tropical storms and hurricanes, such as Tropical Storm Agnes and Isabel. And then there's a third type of flooding called interior flooding, and that's where you have heavy localized rainfall, which overwhelms the storm drain system such as what happened in June 2006 in the Federal Triangle area. Next slide. <clears throat> so our team developed new online maps to display the extent and depth of expected flooding during riverine and tidal flooding. It does not include interior flooding. When the National Weather Service predicts flooding at the existing stream gauges, you'll be able to go online and view these maps that were developed from the Corps of Engineers models. Next slide, please.
Here is a, uh, a quick screenshot from one of the maps. Um, as Nick mentioned, Jason Elliott's going to demonstrate the tool in a few minutes, but I wanted you to have an idea of what the product looks like. Uh, when you click on the predicted flood stage on the left, it will bring up a flood inundation map that, again, shows where it will flood and the depth of flooding. You can see the shaded might be one feet, two feet, et cetera. Next slide, please. So this graphic shows a cross-section showing a normal tide at a ground elevation of five feet. Next slide, please. There's a little animation here, so it'll take a second. If National Weather Service predicts a flood elevation of 10 feet, the depth grid will show five feet of flooding at this location. Next slide, please. The maps were developed for three stream gauges. There's the Potomac River at Georgetown at the upstream end. In the middle, we've got Washington Channel at Southwest Waterfront. And then at the lower end, along the Potomac, is the uh, gauge at Alexandria. Next slide, please. So there's a set of maps associated with each of these three gauges. You'll need to know which gauge covers your area of interest, and that's the gauge you'll have to go to online. Next slide, please. So there's a set of maps for the tidal storm surge flooding and one for riverine. Again, the tidal maps are for water pushing up stream. Uh, next slide, please. You're going to have a little animation here showing the water pushing up the Potomac River. The flood inundation maps extend from Fletcher's Cove on Canal Road in northwest D.C to the mouth of Broad Creek near Fort, Fort Fort, Maryland and Fort Hunt, Virginia, for a distance of approximately 14 miles. Flood maps also extend up trib tributaries such as Four Mile Run, Cameron Run, and Oxen Run along the Potomac River. Maps for the Anacostia River extend from New York Avenue in Northeast DC to its confluence with the Potomac River approximately 10 miles. Next slide, please. And you can actually hit the next slide for the next animation. The riverine maps cover the same areas, but again, this is for heavy rainfall along the Potomac, uh, in the Potomac watershed that flows down to DC. So the riverine flood maps include water backing up into the Anacostia River and other tributaries. Next slide, please. So when a riverine or tidal flood is predicted in DC, Please go out to, these web, to the website and use these maps as they'll be very beneficial. The maps will assist local officials, emergency managers, and emergency managers, and the general public in making decisions about things such as evacuations, road closures, the installation of flood risk management measures, um, things such as moving vehicles uh, out of the way, and also just moving critical items to higher ground and much more. In addition to this being a tool just prior to and during a flood, the maps are also a tool for planning and mitigation purposes. Anyone can view the maps at any time to see what the impacts of a large, that a large event might have. Next slide, please. So before we demonstrate the tool, I wanted you to know what the limitations of the tool are and some of the assumptions made. The maps do not detect the interior storm drain flooding, such as the flooding that occurred in 2006. Again, they only detect uh, floodwaters coming down the Potomac River and for, high, and for uh, tidal events. We did assume a high tide for the riverine floods. So obviously the tides can vary, low tide to high tide during a storm event, um, but the depths that are shown on these maps do assume high tide. Uh, the maps also include the Potomac Park levee system, so it shows the area behind the levee is protected until the levee is over top. So that's that main Potomac Park levee system in downtown D.C. that the Corps built and National Park Service operates and maintains. But other local and federal flood risk management systems are not shown on the map, such as Blue Plains is doing some flood risk management uh, measures now that's under construction, the Georgetown Waterfront. Um, somebody actually has to uh, raise the wall there. 
Um, so that's not shown, that will be shown as flooded unless they put that wall in place. And also don't joint face Anacostia bowling levee flood wall, um, which is not in a, uh, in a great condition, so that's not shown on the map. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that we did use the ground elevation below elevated roadways as a basis for the mapping. So if the ground below an elevated roadway is flooded, then the elevated roadway may be shown as flooded when it is not. And then lastly, I did just want to mention that the, the maps don't con, uh, reflect concurrent significant rain, river rain, and storm surge flooding, but this is a highly rare and unusual occurrence. Again, we just assumed high tide. Um, however, if there is a concurrent event, National Weather Service will certainly uh, predict the flood stage at each stage. However, the maps may not be, um, you know, as accurate as they would be otherwise. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so before uh, Jason Elliott demonstrates the uh, National Weather Service map viewer, I did just want to mention that the U.S. Geological Survey also has a map viewer, and the maps will be posted there sometime in the future. They're not there yet, but sometime in the future. So you will have two different map viewers that you can see the maps. So with that, I will turn things over to Jason for his demonstration. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Good afternoon. This is Jason Elliott from the National Weather Service. Um, my role here today is to sort of take you through a live demonstration of the National Weather Service webpage where these maps are housed. Um, don't worry about seeing any of the web addresses that are at the top of the screen. At the very end of this, we're going to give you two web addresses where you can go to directly access these. So don't worry about copying anything down. Um, we're just going to go through click by click how you use these maps and different ways you can use these maps. And also, the considerations that Stacy mentioned in a couple of slides ago, we're going to, you'll see many of those as we go along. Uh, of course, we're bringing the magic of the Internet to you by letting you see my web browser as we go through. So there will be a couple second delay, but I'll try to pause on each of the steps so that we can catch up to it and you'll be able to see everything I'm talking about. So with that, let's get started. In this case, again, you're going to get the direct links at the end, but I'm starting at our National Weather Service webpage, which is weather.gov slash Washington. If you start here, there are two places to go to get to the maps, and they both go to the same place. There's a rivers and lakes option here at the top, and there's also an icon below the map. Either one's going to go to the same place. It doesn't matter which one you click on. If you use the direct links we give you at the end, this won't matter. So I'm going to click on that, and that's going to bring up another web page that's zoomed into the localized area. Um, a bunch of diamonds and circles and squares, and that doesn't really matter for the purposes of our demonstration today. Um, but where we are going to focus are on the three squares that you see right near the district. And I'm going to zoom in on those, and it'll take a couple seconds for that to catch up to us. But uh, there are three squares that stand out right in the Washington, D.C. area, and those are the three locations that Stacy mentioned a couple moments ago, Georgetown, Southwest Waterfront, and Alexandria. Uh, all three have exactly the same information, and at the link we give you at the end, that link will tell you which one of those three you should click on for your area of interest. Uh, of course, if you're interested in the entire reach, you're going to have to click on all three individually one at a time. But um, that's actually important because the forecast could be different at each of those three locations. In this case, I'm going to click on the middle square. First, I'm going to hover over it. That's the Washington Channel at Southwest Waterfront. That's right off of Main Avenue in Southwest D.C. When I hover over this location, a graph pops up on the top right of the screen, or it could be another, another corner of the screen depending on where you are or what web browser you're using. But in this case, I'm going to click on this square, and that's going to take us to a web page that will eventually get you to the mapping. But I do want to point out a few things on this page before we get there. Um, this is our main page. It's available for any of our stream gauges, whether they have the mapping or not. Uh, the blue line on the left side is the, ob is the observed data going back five days. The purple line on the right side is our National Weather Service forecast, which goes out 72 hours from this morning. So there's about 66 hours of it left on the screen here. Below this graph is a wealth of additional information that I want to make sure you're aware of, even though it's not directly related to the mapping. Below the map, or below the graph, I should say, 
is information about historic crest data. You see many of the floods that Stacy mentioned, 36, 42, 33, Agnes, Isabel, they're all there. Um, and as you'll see when we get to the maps, you'll see those, on, those type of levels on the maps and you'll see much higher. Flood stage at Southwest Waterfront, shown here 4.2 feet. That flood stage will be different at the other two locations, so make sure you check that out for yourself. And some of the recent crests, and you notice that some of these recent crests of five feet or so are nothing compared to what happened in the more major events. It's been a long time since we've had a really major flood, and that's why these maps are so important, because there are a lot of people who've never seen even the types of floods we have had, and these maps will show them what those looked like and what those would look like if they happen again today. One last thing that I want to point out before we get to the maps is this link for FEMA's National Flood Hazard Layers. If I click this checkbox and turn it on, then the map that's up here at the top right of your screen will paint in with the FEMA flood layers for those of you who are familiar with those. Those don't correlate directly to our maps. They're for different purposes. But these are available for those of you who know them already so that you can look at them and see the FEMA flood maps. And finally, this last thing here is flood impacts and photos. You see a bunch of words here that I'm not going to go over. But the bottom line is those words are what are represented by our maps. So that's why the maps are so important, because I, I can tell you these words that are here, but when you see them on a map, it means a whole lot more. So enough about that. Let's get to the maps. If you want to see a map at the very top of the page here at the top right, there's a tab that says Inundation Mapping. If you click on that, that's going to take you directly to the maps. And I'm going to jump forward to those maps rather than clicking. Um, so here is the map page. And again, there's a lot going on here. So I'm going to walk you through step by step each of these elements that's on the page. First of all, when the map comes up, it's defaulted to the lowest level available. Um, so in this case, the lowest level that's shown here is 3.1 feet, and this is actually going to repaint in for us here. But that 3.1 foot level is below flood stage. So when that first map pops up, it's actually showing no inundation at all. As I move up, the map will change. I can go to different layers and different levels. The gauge location is the green dot that's in the center of the image. And then at the right here, you see a color ramp that goes from lighter colors up to darker colors. That directly corresponds to the shading that you see here on the map. So the darker the color is, the deeper the water is going to be. If that color is as it is here, kind of a milky white, then there's really no depth at all. Again, as we said, this default map that comes up is actually not showing flooding. So with that, let me zoom in a little bit and we'll sort of take a little bit of a tour right around the gauge location here in East Potomac Park. So I'm going to hover over a higher level. You see there that the record crest is 11.05 feet, so I'm going to select the map that's closest to it, which is just above that record crest of 11.3 feet. You also notice on the, left, on the left side here that we actually have maps that go up to stage 20. So we're going way above anything that's ever happened before, and hopefully 20 feet never happened. But the bottom line is these highest maps are here for planning purposes so that way in advance of an event you could see, well, what if this did happen? So again, we're here at the 11.3 foot level, and you see that most of East Potomac Park is inundated at this point. And that's going to be helpful for us to uh, – see what's going on. I'm going to scroll down just a bit, and that's going to take a couple seconds to paint in, because I want to point out what's just below the map that you weren't seeing. The current water level, that's not anything related to the map. It's just telling you that right now it's 1.7 feet, the level. So again, no flooding happening right now. We've selected stage 11.3, so we're 10 feet below what we're showing on the map. As I move the mouse over, and it's going to be hard to see because of the delay, but that depth number will change somewhat or slightly, depending on where my mouse is, to a different number. You see, that you may be able to see it's changed from 8 feet down to 3 feet as we go along. Uh, more on that in a minute. But that's one way to get your depth number. There's, I'll show you a couple other ways in just a second. 
The if I'm going to actually click on one of these points now in East Potomac Park, and there is a pop-up that's going to come up that says 3.76 to 5.76 feet, and that's at the exact location where I've clicked on. Uh, then I can remove that and go back to scrolling around if I want to. But that way, if I have a specific location I want to I want to zero in on, I can click on that spot, get a marker, and be able to immediately see what's going to go on. So now I'm going to move up a little bit to the 17th Street area. You heard Stacy talk about the 17th Street closure, and you see there it's represented. So nothing is making it past that spot. But plenty is making it on the other side of that spot, as you see. Um, and again, I'll click in that, that location just to the east of the World War II Memorial on 17th Street. And around the record crest, there's somewhere around three to five feet of water on 17th Street at the record crest. So the other way you can get this same information, if you know an address of a critical location that you want to find, you can punch that address in right here at the top right of the map. So let's say that my location of interest was 1314 Main Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C. I'm going to put that in the top right and click this magnifying glass search button. And occasionally you'll get this pop-up that comes up that says, confirm for me where you really wanted to go, just in case you wanted to be somewhere slightly different. In this case, I really did mean 1314 Main Avenue, so I'll click on that. It's going to zoom me to that location, which will take a couple seconds to paint in here. But once it does, you're going to see a couple of the other things Stacy talked about. First of all, on the left side, you see some of those elevated roadways. 395 is not flooded, or 11th Street is not flooded in that case. But these roads underneath are. So that's the case we were talking about earlier where you may have the elevated street isn't really flooded even though it shows that it is. But back to my 1314 Main Avenue, if I want to know the depth of the water at 1314 Main Avenue on this map, I can just click on this blue marker that popped up. It'll turn it to a red marker and give me the same information that I had previously, in this case, somewhere between two and four feet of water depth at the record crest. So I'm going to reset the view here and show you a couple other things. This will, again, take a couple seconds to paint back in. But at the top left of the page here, you see three data types, inundation levels, flood categories, and current forecast. Just really briefly, I wanted to click on flood categories to show you that those are available if you don't want to deal with all the various numbers, the 2.7s and the 6.5s of the world. You can go to this instead and select flood stage categories. Now, an important note about this is the maps that you're seeing are the highest map for the category. So when I'm on this below flood map, that's the highest map before it starts flooding. And if I switch to minor flood, that's the highest minor flood before it goes to the moderate flood level, which moderate flood would mean in a whole bunch of buildings and significantly affecting travel. So this is the map that's right before that starts to happen. One last thing before I leave this, you notice down here at the bottom there's inundation on four mile run indicated. I want to make sure everyone knows that on Four Mile Run and on Cameron Run further south and on these other tributaries that come in, Rock Creek would be another, all you're seeing here is the inundation from the Potomac. You're not seeing anything that might be coming downstream of those streams. So just as it doesn't depict interior flooding in D.C., it doesn't depict the riverine flooding of these small tributaries either. So everything you're seeing on the maps is specifically related to a Potomac Anacostia flood. And the third option here for data type, current slash forecast, when I click on that, a big map is going to pop up that says there's no, no, no flooding because it's not flooding right now. But we're going to get close over the next 24 hours. So there's one option here, 3.77 feet. And when I hover over that, it brings up a map for the closest map to 3.77 feet and lets me take a look at it. Again, that's below the flood stage, so what you're seeing here is a non-flood. You're basically seeing an outline of the river for the most part. 
but there is a little bit of inundation. If I zoomed in on East Potomac Park, you'd see a little bit of water coming up there, but again, it's below the official flood stage. We also mentioned that there are two sets of maps here. Everything that I've just shown you are just for freshwater flooding. If I go below the map, there's a section here labeled Map Overlays, and you see tidal inundation layers, there's 10 of them, available from 4 feet all the way up to 15 feet. And I can click on any of those to turn them on, and I'm going to come up just a little bit here, bear with me. Uh, I can turn any of those on and in turn turn off the one I had on, as you see here. So now I've got the tidal inundation 7.4 feet listed. Um, so that's how I can bring a tidal inundation layer on instead of those fresh water if you know that it's a, for example, a tropical storm and it's going to be all tidal surge. But there's one last thing I want to point out. I want to zoom back in on that main avenue area that we were at a couple minutes ago and show you one thing. If I turn on the 10-foot tidal layer and come up here and turn on the 10-foot freshwater layer, those are both going to paint in. And when they both paint in, it's going to be hard to see on this, but there's very little difference between the two. I'm going to try to toggle back and forth in such a way that you can see it, but there's very little difference, almost none. So. For the most part, especially if you're in this middle reach, the southwest waterfront reach, you can use these maps almost interchangeably. As you go further up toward past Georgetown or further down south of Alexandria, that may not be as much of the case. In those cases, my recommendation is that you turn both the freshwater and the tidal on if they're close to each other and use the worst case as your planning tool. Below that section where you pick the map overlays, there's some site-specific information, which is largely the same information that Stacy presented about the considerations and limitations, uh, and also the same information that was available to you on the previous page that I showed you with the historic crests and those flood impacts. Those are also available here, too. One last thing. Everything I've just gone through here is just for that southwest waterfront gauge, but the exact same thing, I could repeat it twice for the other two and you'd see exactly the same things. In this case, I'll flip over very briefly to Georgetown. There's, here's the hydrograph for Georgetown that we showed you, the same one for Southwest Waterfront a couple minutes ago. And when I click on inundation mapping on this, it will similarly take me to the inundation map for that part of the river, which in this case is essentially from the uh, Memorial Bridge up all the way up to uh, Fletcher's Cove at the northwest end of D.C. So this is the web page that you're going to see the link to in just a second, um, weather.gov slash Washington slash Potomac inundation maps. What we have here is those reaches, these are the same graphics that Stacy showed, but we tell you that there are certain landmarks available to you. Um, that are within that reach, so if there's certain assets that you're, that you're interested in, this may help you figure out which map you need to look at. And then there's links there to be able to bookmark the one that you're the most interested in. And there's that link, weather.gov slash Washington slash Potomac Inundation Maps. DC government also has a very similar website that provides the same links, uh, and there's their website as well, doee.dc.gov slash service slash F-I-M. And that is the demo, and I will turn it back over to Nick. All right, thanks, Jason. Um, so that concludes the presentation portion of, of the webinar today. So we've got really the next 30 minutes or so to answer questions. Um, so we have both Jason and Stacy available, but we've also invited some of the experts that worked on this tool um, they're also on the line to help answer any questions. So it looks like we've received uh, one question over chat, so we'll take that one first. Um, you guys can keep um, asking questions in the chat box, and then um, after we go through those, we will open up the phone lines to ask, um, so you can ask questions through that. So the first question, um, 
I think we'll have Stacy start with this one, and it is what is measuring water depth sensors at each location? Question mark. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, not exactly sure what's asking, but I'm going to go through it, and um, and hopefully this answers your question. So, um, the Corps of Engineers uh, did computer modeling um, of the river. Um, and it's tied to the, to the stream gauges. So a National Weather Service has their own models that look at the rainfall that's predicted, and then they estimate what the flood levels are going to be at those gauges. And then the computer modeling that the Corps did, um, with that information, it, it can determine what the, uh, what the flood levels will be upstream and downstream of that gauge. And then with the topography, it basically, you know, shows what area would flood, and then it gives a depth, a depth uh, of flooding at each location. So I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. I'm hoping that answered the question. I think that was a that was definitely a, a good um, overview. And if the the person who asked that question, if they want to follow up, go ahead and um, type in the chat box. But we've gotten some more. Um, so we'll go to the next question. Um, I think this one will also be Stacy as well. Uh, so the question is this: Is this the program? Is this program funded exclusively through an Army Corps line item, or do these partner agencies, states, and localities kick in? And if it's the latter, how do you navigate to carrying funds across different partners and in different appropriations bills? Okay, so this is Stacy. Yep, I'll take that. A uh, very good question. Um, and it's really, uh, this has been just uh, an outstanding partnership. Uh, the way that the Silver Jackets program works is the Corps of Engineers gets funding uh, for Silver Jackets interagency projects. We actually submit proposals each year on various types of projects that uh, we believe will reduce flood risk. And so we put together this interagency proposal, and the Corps of Engineers got funding for a part of the project. We got funding to update the modeling and do the mapping. However, all of the other agencies came with their own money and their own resources and time and, um, and helped us with the project. Uh, USGS actually used their own money to do data collection to make the model better. Um, DC, Department of the Environment, um, and National Weather Service are kind of uh, spearheading the, the outreach program. Um, so they've been, you know, setting up the webinars and, and, and doing the website and that sort of thing. So all of the different agencies actually came with our different um, expertise. Uh, to be honest with you, no, no money cr uh, crossed hands except for um, in order to upload the maps to the National Weather Service um, site to have their contractor do it, DC, Department of Energy and Environment, and I believe it was Arlington County had to, to provide some funding to upload the maps. But basically, it's all the different agencies using their own money to come to the table and just kind of using in-kind services. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Stacey. Okay, and we've got um, two questions that I think are best directed to Jason. I'll start with the first one. Um, and that question is, what information does this tool provide beyond what was available before? So we'll, we'll go with that one first. Well, there's there's a couple different answers to that. Um, you know, we've as I mentioned back in the demo, we've had the FEMA flood information, which there's a there's an elevation that's the FEMA 100 year 1 percent flood elevation, and there's a map that goes along with that. But that's one elevation. Now we have maps for all elevations, including elevations that are way above anything that's ever happened before. So the tool the tool gives us the opportunity to see all those things both in a real-time sense, if you want to tie it to the National Weather Service forecast, and in a planning sense, if you want to see, you know, for, for any, any number of reasons, if you want to see what level a certain thing is going to go underwater, or if you want to see if there's a foot of sea level rise over the next 50 years, what that's going to mean to take today's level and add a foot to it. There's, those, are, those are two very easy applications for this tool that we really didn't have in the past. All right. Um, I think that I think that'll help answer that question. And then the a second kind of follow up question uh, is: Any of the map data available for download? Absolutely. Uh, let's see if I can get to that link real quick. Bear with me here. I'm, okay. 
uh, it's sort of a small thing here, but there is a link. I'm on the wrong page, Sam. I apologize. There's a small link on the bottom right of the map here that's going to come up. And there's a small icon here for KML. And so all these layers can be downloaded in KML format to put in Google Earth. So we've, we've made it all available in that way. So I think there's a, there's a bit of a delay with the, with the website. Just want to make sure um, that we can see where that link is. Are you hovering over it right now, Jason? I am, yes. Okay, yeah, so at least from my screen, I had to scroll down in the webinar software just to see the bottom of the screen. Um, the little KML icon, okay. I'll, I'll move it up a little bit. Yeah. All right, so that's where you can download the layers. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. Thanks, Jason, for that. Um, okay, we'll take this one. Might We'll start with Jason, and anyone else can chime in for this question, um, which is, you might have mentioned it, but which parts of D.C. are considered the most vulnerable to floods? The D.C. Silver Jackets team has actually been working on this very heavily. In fact, there are folks that I absolutely know are on the call who have been very much working on this, aren't in a speaker role today. Uh, and so there's a lot of sort of still to be determined on that. The, the maps are going to show you where the most vulnerable places are to a Potomac Anacostia flood, but certainly there are other places related to interior flooding of rock creeks, even storm drains, the Federal Triangle, that aren't going to be represented on these maps. So they're, they're, we have to be vigilant and aware of where the flood risk is everywhere and do everything we can to mitigate that risk. This tool will help for some of it, but it's not going to be a single solution to identify all of it. So the Silver Jackets team is working to kind of find all of those places and make sure that there's something in place and that we can try to help mitigate things where possible. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm also going to ask uh, Pitt Mano, um, who is the floodplain manager for the District of Columbia, to, to chime in here. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, this is Pitt Mano, kind of all from Department of Energy and Environment. Just want to add to what Jason just mentioned that I think the, the easy way to start looking at is by using this tool. And uh, Jason mentioned it, that there is a FEMA floodplain map within the National Weather Service webpage or this site. So it, it would be something to, to look into the area of the uh, the flood hazard area in the district, and you know, as as Jason mentioned, that the interior flooding that that we have been, you know, talking about today, that it's it's something that our civil jackets team has been working on to uh, collect data and collect you know information to kind of make it um, known to us the area that 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 experience particular interior for flooding, but for riverine and tidal, you can start using this tool and also FEMA uh, flood insurance rate map as a guide to look at the area um, um, to look into. Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, so this is a this is an easy one. I think Stacey can take this. Um, I'm not saying Stacey can take it because it's easy. I'm just saying the best. <laughs> Good. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. Um, so will we be sharing the PowerPoint presentation from this webinar? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, with the PowerPoint, Sarah, jump in. Yeah, the whole webinar um, is, has been recorded with the audio, so that will be um, posted on the DOEE website that is shown on this slide here. Uh, within the the next week or so. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got another question clarifying some elevation data. Um, so I guess I'm not sure who will start with that, but I'll read the question. Uh, so these maps 
reconciled all of the elevation data and water flood level data to determine the on-land flood elevation. So I guess looking well, for I a little more. Ahead, okay, so Stacey, go ahead. Um, I guess uh, if I if I understand it correctly, um, to answer her question, for the modeling, you know, we used uh, the data on NAVD88 and the LIDAR topography we use is NAVD88, and so everything uses that. Um, so yes, I guess that's a reconcile if that's what the question is. I think they're also. I, I do know that um, you kind of had to stitch together a couple of different topographic layers. Is that something you can talk about, Stacey? Uh, no, I think it was all one LIDAR. Um, anybody can correct me if I'm wrong. I know we did have like various high water marks and in, in like for old historical storms and we were calibrating the model and those we did have to reconcile all different datums to make sure that the model was calibrated correctly. So that was a very challenging process, but we were able to work through that and get everything in the in the right datum. I can add to that, Stacy. Um, this is Craig Thomas with the Corps of Engineers. What was stitched together were bathymetric data, the below water portions of the Potomac River. So we had several different sources of information um, for our hydraulic modeling for the for the underwater portions of the Potomac River. Um, but all the Land portions were were from the one were from the same lidar derived data source. Okay, thanks, Craig, and thanks, Stacy. Um, all right, we have a couple more questions on here. Um, let's see. One of the questions is: Are there plans to help determine interior flood risk in the future? And maybe maybe uh, we'll have maybe Stacy, since you're um, a co-leader of the Silver Jackets, you can uh, just mention anything that that the Silver Jackets are doing with that. Well, well I didn't know if you wanted to actually uh, talk about the Interior Flood uh, Task Group that we have. So, okay. so do you want to chat, yeah. talk about that? I think that's really you know how we're moving forward with Interior Flood. Sure. Um, so as far as interior flooding goes, the, the tricky thing is, is getting the data, trying to look at past data of where interior flooding has occurred, and, and the way we end up doing that is kind of by, by proxy. Um, so getting information from uh, utilities and other folks who've, who have called in and said, or, or who have had customers call in and said that there's flooding at this location, and trying to aggregate that and put it on a map. Um, so we're working on, on something to, to show generally where interior flooding has happened um, in the past, but I think there is still um, a lot to do in terms of um, modeling the topography and then you know, adding additional rainfall on top of that. So there's no, um, there's no model that we have that's anything like um, what was presented in this webinar. Um, but I do think that's something that a lot of people are, are interested in. So I'll I'll stop there, and um, whoever asks, asks a question, they can they can follow up with us if they're if they're interested. Okay, and then um, looks like the last question we have via chat is is this: um, Are there other big flood prevention projects being planned um, in the D.C. area, like the 17th Street levee? I'll, I'll throw this one to Stacy for now. Okay, sure. And and Pat Minor, feel free to, to chime in. Um, yeah, right now there's you know nothing nothing you know under construction or all. We, the Corps of Engineers right now is supporting a uh, a study with Washington Navy Yard to look at their uh, their flood risk and ways that they can uh, help reduce it. Um, we're looking at non-structural flood proofing type solutions and structural things such as flood walls. Um, but again, that, that's in the you know early planning stages, and I'm not sure you know what will be implemented there. Um, we are actually you know as we mentioned, the flood inundation mapping was a Silver Jackets interagency project. We did just get funding for another interagency Silver Jackets project along Wasp Branch in D.C., uh, which is also in the floodplain. So we're about to kick that study off in the next month. 
And again, we'll be looking at all different non-structural flood proofing and structural options there, working with the public, making sure they understand the flood risk. Um, so those are the two really that the core is involved with. Setmano, I don't know if you want to mention anything else that DC is involved in. Um, I just want to mention that you know our DC Civil with Jack is is very active, and we meet four times a year, and we have several. I think right now we have about five task groups to kind of look at different. Um, aspect of flood risk, you know, interior flooding, the levy uh, enhancement, and, you know, how, how we communicate flood risk. And so we have been, you know, we have more than 20 agencies, federal, district, and regional agencies kind of get together to talk about the issue in different aspects, different areas, and, and we will, you know, continue talking and try to find, you know, solutions from uh, flood issue that we, we are facing, you know, as you mentioned, in terms of interior flooding and some um, improvement of the levy that we, we know that, that, you know, that bigger flood would come and how we can address that. So that sort of, you know, that ongoing kind of collaboration among these uh, member agencies that are working on the flood issue in this district. Okay, thanks, Amal. Um, let's see. So that's all the the questions that we have. Oh, just got another one. Uh, okay, so I'll read it here. A, a few years ago, FEMA had an exercise for hurricane for a hurricane, which had a, had the 14th Street Bridge, Memorial Bridge, and Key Bridge totally underwater. Um, the question is, what flood level would that be to create that kind of scenario? And I don't know if anyone knows that offhand, but it might be something that we could go to the uh, to the tools to look at. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, Jason, I will put this one on you. I think the answer is going to be way above anything we have mapped. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm, I'm going to the highest one right now, and they're still showing out of the water. Yeah, and something to look at here might, um, you know, so the, the actual bridge surface might be out of the water, but the ability to get on the on ramps and the ability to get on the bridge um, may be inundated, and that's kind of what Jason's showing. So this is something you could play around with the uh, inundation mapper and, and see at what point are all the access roads. Um, kind of underwater, which renders the bridge unusable. So that's the answer we'll go with. I don't think we um, we'll have a specific number for you on that. Okay, and um, so I do think, uh, so Colin, our, our moderator from at and I do think we could open it up uh, for questions on the phone, and I actually did want to uh, single out um, Amanda Campbell, who um, is working on a joint project with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and the Army Corps of Engineers, and maybe she just wanted to um, have a quick plug about that. Yeah, actually, and I, I did forget to mention that when uh, talking about the different planning activities going on. Um, but yeah, the Corps of Engineers is, uh, is going to be developing a scope of work, like you said, with the Council of Governments. Who I believe is going to have some side agreements with the uh, with some other um, with the DC and other municipalities, um, basically to look at you know at, at reducing uh, flood risk from from coastal storms in DC. Uh, so we're still not sure you know what the what the focus is going to be, um, but we know that everybody wants to work together and continue to look at the the risk from coastal storms. Um, this is actually a follow-up from the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coast Study that the Corps did following uh, Hurricane Sandy. Um, so the Corps has received, you know, money to, to work with uh, uh, other municipalities and, and look closer at the flood risk in D.C. and find ways to reduce risk. But more to come on that. They're still, uh, they're still in the scoping phase. Okay, great. Thanks, Stacey. So, Colin, is there a way to open up the, uh, the phone line to everyone? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question over the phone lines, you can do so by pressing pound 2 on your telephone handset. 
You will be notified once your line is unmuted and pressing pound two a second time will remove you from the question queue. So again, that's pound two if you would like to ask a question over the phone line. And I would, I would also say, Amanda, if you want to follow up at all about the, um, the joint study with the, with the Army Corps and the COG, um, go ahead and, and just call in. That will, looks like we do have a hand raised. Uh, that will go to our first caller. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Angela Mitchell at FEMA headquarters. I wanted to say that the question about the Hurricane Zoe was mine. Uh, you all gave a fantastic answer because at the time that we participated in that ex exercise, um, I was very concerned about what that would mean for other areas of Washington, D.C if in fact all three bridges were underwater. So I really appreciate you all showing how the tool would be used to measure that. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Angela. Okay, we do have another hand raise going now to our next caller. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Pete Carey, Carey, DOE, and I'm addressing this question to Pat Manu. Does DC have any future plans to look at um, the flooding impacts in Oxford Run watershed due to future developments? Hi, Tim. This is yeah. Ted Mano. Yeah. Yes. Um, in fact, yes, we, we are. Um, separately, uh, we, we have been working with the, with the Corps of Engineers in Baltimore District and then Stacey can talk more about it too, is that we, we have a plan looking at the, the flood risk issue along Hudson One um, uh, watershed along with our uh, stream restoration project. That, that's something that's, that's going on. Yeah, I will chime in. So, yeah, so, so Oxen One, the Corps of Engineers actually has an existing flood risk management project um, there, and, and, the, and the, the stream meanders through Prince George's County and, and D.C. Um, and so, yeah, we are working with D.C. Uh, to look at that and um, mainly do some modeling there, see if there's actually some um, modifications we can make to the stream to make it um, more environmentally uh, friendly, I guess, and, and with potential modifications to the project or not. So the bottom line is we want to try to maybe restore the environment, but without losing that flood capacity that the project already provides. So yes, we're currently stud uh, working on that now, and it will be done in about a, a year from now. All right, thank you. Also, I just want to add that this project is a collaboration not just uh, D.C. And, and the Corps, but also with the Prince George's County as well because of the way that we want to look at it. It's, it's by watershed that covers both jurisdictions, so it would be inter, you know, jurisdictional kind of project, um, watershed-based uh, flood mitigation project. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our next caller. Please go ahead. I think this is me. Hi. Um, a relatively easy question. It's about what what um, high water markers are there within the district? Are there several? They're always very interesting to see and to be able to educate others. I've seen two or three, you know, markings against buildings perhaps where that indicate how high the water's got in various floods. Is there maybe a, a short list of them somewhere? Well, that's a very good question, and actually that's something the D.C. Silver Jackets team is talking about. I'm personally not aware of any that exist right now. I mean, we have, like, elevations from past events that folks know how, how deep the water was, how high it was. But as far as you're talking about um, public markers where people can go and see the markings, if that's what you're asking about, we yep. were just talking about that at our last Silver Jackets project that we'd like to do some outreach 
and possibly um, install some markers. But right now, I don't know if there are any. Uh, Jason and Fentmano, anybody else aware of any that exist? Uh, if I may still be on, I don't know. But they're, they're along the mall, I think there's one, yes. isn't there, on Constitution and 17th. And then, and then this, it, the other one that I'm aware of is not a public one, but, but over where Ned Wallace used to have his, well, where his office is on, on Haynes Point. The Park Service fellow. But, uh, sorry, I, I think you asked. Somebody else may have something on that. Yeah, Petmano, are you are you aware of any existing high water marks? Yeah, I I I'm I am aware of the one on Constitution and 15th, I believe. And yeah, I'm not aware of in the National Park Service uh, land. So. It, yeah, it would be something that we can look into, kind of, you know, to document all these high water marks and, and kind of and also look into new location that can work with the community, whether or not we can kind of, you know, identify more location to put the high water marks. May I ask who is asking this question? Maybe I can follow up. I'm sorry, Fatmano. This is. Ben Curran, okay. you and I have been in touch. I'm also with you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Looks like we have a few more hands raised. So with that, we'll go to our next caller. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. This is Hamid Karimi, the DC Department of Environment. Uh, and uh, as I watched the tool, I found it to be very user-friendly, very helpful to us. Just basically wanted to thank everybody for working on it. I think it's going to come really handy to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And with that, we'll move to our next caller. Please go ahead. Hello, this is Amir Ali Maura from the DC Office of Planning. Um, I have a question on how to use the tool. Um, so when I scroll down, I see that there is a, a list of historic crests. And when you click, you get a really nice handy list by height. And my question was, if I wanted to model, say, the highest crest, which was 11 point zero five feet in nineteen forty two. And uh, cause the district in nineteen forty two was very different from what it is now and I would just be curious to see what that flood would look like in southwest DC today. How do I get that eleven point zero five mapped? I'll take that. This is Jason. Um so it in this case, when the numbers on the left side here, there's two sets of numbers. The one that corresponds to the crest is the one on the right. So that would be this, the, the closest one to 11.05 would be 11.3. So that's the map that you would choose. Uh, and then you would scroll to your area of interest, wherever that may be. Okay. And it, of course, as you, as you say, this is gonna be 11.3 feet on today's map and there were different things going on back then. So there may be things that there probably would have been back in 1942 more inundation than what would happen today because of flood walls and things like that. Uh, but th that's how you would see what that would mean today is by picking out the 11.3 map because that's the closest one and then going to whatever area you're interested in. So, so I have to look at those, uh, the numbers under the stage column. What, what is the That's MAD, right, yeah, because the, the these gauges are measuring column. in the state, are, are measuring a stage level that isn't a true elevation, so you'll use the numbers on the right-hand column to correspond to what the gauge is okay. reading. Okay, all right, thank you so much, and this is a great tool, uh, thank you. Okay, and at the moment, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. Just a quick reminder, you can press pound two if you would like to ask a question. Yep, so Colin, we've got, we have one more question on the, uh, on the chat, which I will take. Um, so the question is, would you include the tunnel near Bloomingdale as a DC water example of current work to reduce interior flooding? 
And um, I would say, so you, so you correctly identified that that's a DC water project, and actually the initial reason for that happening, for, for that being um, a project in the first place, was to reduce the combined sewer overflows into the Anacostia and Potomac rivers. But um, it also has this obvious added benefit of um, reducing the interior flooding because it can capture the stormwater instead of uh, leaking it back out onto the streets. Um, it can stay inside that the giant tunnel that they've constructed there. So it's a little bit of a dual purpose. Um, one is kind of environmental and combined to what it but the other is definitely um, interior flooding. So we are coming up on um, 205, I think, and I think this was a, a one-hour uh, webinar. Can you confirm that? Stacey and Sarah? Yes. Okay. Um, so we've got the we've got this last slide um, up here with uh, with the website on it, um, and I I believe there'll be some contact information for specific folks on that website if you uh, oh and yes so we'll leave this one up for a second. We've got Stacy's email and Jason's email. If you have any other questions about what you saw today. Um, Feel free to email or call them, I guess. We have the number right there. Um, so that's it uh, for today. Um, I'd like to thank both Stacy and Jason for a great job presenting and all of the um, experts that we had on the line. Um, thanks very much to everyone for joining. And uh, don't forget to check back on the website, and we'll have the recorded presentation there for you. All right, thanks very much.